Hey there, happy Thanksgiving to the Americans. Uh, to the rest of you, sorry, you're out of luck. <laughs> um, just kidding, but I haven't been on here in a little bit. I'm very busy. Uh, I got hired again to do a tour with the Air Force Band doing their a concert series of Christmas stuff. Um, it's very humbling whenever I do this. It's always out of my comfort zone. It's always a little beyond my skill set with really highly professional musicians that are used to doing certain things a certain way and then I come in and I'm it's just it's something. Uh, I think God arranges these things for me just to take care of my needs but also to keep me really dependent on him uh, and I usually eat humble pie through the whole thing it's really um, it's something but whatever I'm, I'm privileged and thankful to have the opportunity but I, I've been very busy uh, I am still in Ephesians and I'll be getting back to it as soon as I can um, but somebody asked me to do a video they're moving from one church to another and their friends well they're really struggling with institutional church and what they're really struggling with is their friends just don't understand their concerns they can kind of see it but they're like you're just making a big deal about nothing and it's about the gospel but you know it's a really tough topic you know, it would be much easier, you would think. I mean, my flesh says it would be easier if I could just capitulate and go to the institutional church. It would solve so many problems in my family and in my relationships with Christians and with, I mean, you know, you know how it is if you are on the outside. Uh, you can't talk about it without sounding like you are just a complainer. You know, they don't understand. If they understood, they would be standing with you. If they were sensitive to the things that you're sensitive to, they would understand. But they, they're not. So... And in fact, the fact that you're sensitive to these things and when you try to explain it, all you do is prove to them that you have a problem because now you're articulating it, which proves that you're sensitive to it. And the sensitivity in their mind is the problem because it proves you're negative or it proves that, you know, you can't do it. And you have to understand that to them and to us, being involved in the church is a virtue. It's a virtuous thing. So that's their virtue. And you not going, for whatever reason, is your failure. And any reason you don't go is negative. So you've got, if you feel like you are resigned that you're not going, you've also got to resign yourself that it's not going to be understood. And Hebrews talks about, you know, at that time it was Jerusalem and the temple system. And they were having to, to really overcome it and come out. They could find no rest in the temple system. Jesus wasn't in the temple system and they knew it. But all their relatives were there and everything related to God seemed to be there. And it seemed to be the thing to do in order to be obedient. According to the scriptures even. And yet, to come out meant to go outside the camp bearing his reproach. That's how it's described in Hebrews. Let us go outside with outside the camp bearing his reproach. That means to be outside the camp in, you know, in the wilderness was a terrible thing. It meant you were a leper or a scapegoat. You had the sin of the people on you and you were out being burned or you're a leper and you're not able to be received in the fellowship. And Jesus bore our sins outside the camp. Which means there's no expectation of fellowship or acceptance. 
you're out. And that is the picture that Paul paints for us. If you're going to go out and you're bearing his reproach, the reproach of the people, and you're not bearing it complaining, you're bearing it, uh, you're not bearing it surprised, you've got to be willing to bear it and recognize that this is your portion. We want to vind... See, the, the struggle with... The, the final struggle for the conscience to leave, if, if this is what you feel like you're supposed to do, is that you want to be justified before men. I do. I want my family to think I'm spiritual. I want them to think I know biblical truth and know God and I'm pursuing God, but they don't. You know? They know I have a YouTube channel. They're not interested in that. They, they probably think it's a, a, some kind of weird cult thing, you know? Uh, they're not going to understand that. To them, you're in disobedience. And there's not a thing you can say to change that. <laughs> and if you feel that this is what you've got to do you're going to have to accept it and this is the hard thing you know we want to come out and then we want to also prove we're right and we're not right that's not the point uh, we came out because we can't survive in the system and in fact, we're weaker than everybody else. Everybody else is strong enough to survive it. But we were too weak to survive it. We didn't come out because we were victorious. We came out because we were defeated. We couldn't take the burden anymore. We couldn't bear up under the demand anymore. And we didn't come out because we were victorious. We came out because we could not, for some reason receive the comforts of the Lord in that situation and we had to come out and we came out to a physician because we were sick and we came out to you know our righteousness this one Jesus who is our righteousness because we're sinners because we failed and because we're weak because we don't have the character to endure you know if you think about it People who are in the institutional church and endure year after year after year and faithfully serve and faithfully go and faithfully endure and they stay positive and they don't complain and they continue to give their all no matter what happens and they're there, you know, whatever you think, um, on at least according to human character, they're better than us. I'll give them that. But I'm not here to build up that kind of righteousness. Um, again, I came out because I failed. Now, a lot of people will say, see, here's the thing. I agree that in the Bible, we're told that we're to assemble. And there clearly is a pattern with elders and deacons and coming together and having a Lord's table. And because of that, I sought for 20 years, not half-heartedly, but desperately for the church where I could. I drove for hours. I looked at everything in my city. And I, uh, I never joined half-heartedly or with a hidden agenda. If I joined a place, it was with my full heart to be a positive blessing, you know. But that's part of the problem was that I wanted to, you know, the Bible says if you can't do something, do, do all things, uh, whatever you put your hand to, do it with your whole heart. And I couldn't do it half-heartedly. And the only way to survive is to do it half-heartedly. 
you know, I know people who've been there for a long time and the way they endure the sermons and the mix of law and grace is to so-called eat the hay and throw out the sticks and ignore what doesn't bother them. Well, that the only way to do that is to be there only with half of your being. You can't give yourself fully to that, and they know it. And so they say, why do you take it so seriously? You know? Well, I can't help it. That's who I am. And that's my weakness, you know? Uh, and that is a problem. I wish I could take it not so seriously. I wish I could be more lighthearted. I wish I could just kind of relax and chill out, you know? But when I'm engaged in something that's supposed to be spiritual, I want to engage with my spirit. And there is a block there because there's error. There's a spirit of error. And there's a mix of tares and wheat and unbelievers and false teaching and false doctrine and systems of error and winds of doctrine, all kinds of crazy stuff. And eventually, I had to come out, you know? Now, the other thing is... There's no way that I could stand strongly on the truth the way I do on this channel if I was going to an institutional church and participating in a half-hearted way, pretending to agree with things that I don't in order to be nice and get along with people. Because the way we deal with the the way we minister is by the manifestation of the truth we commend ourselves to every man's conscience and we've renounced the hidden things and, uh, and we don't adulterate the word and we you know we're transparent and the only way to do that is to be clear and we can't do that if we are spiritually engaged in a lukewarm way playing politics and religion. There's no way. Um, and I did not become super clear on the truth until I came out. Now again, I'm not saying that coming out of the institutional church is a victory. It was defeat. My time in the institutional church was nothing but defeat. Nobody thought I was anything. I made a fool of myself everywhere I went because I could not survive those situations. I just couldn't do it. I couldn't do it socially, and I couldn't do it uh, for a number of reasons. And the people who do do it well can rightfully judge me and say, I can do it better. You didn't do it. You failed where I succeeded. Fine. But now I'm so glad that I'm out because now I can see things I could never see before. You know, about grace, about Paul's ministry, about the New Testament ministry, about the spirit and life, about what is the church, about uh, the dispensation of the grace of God for the Gentiles, all the things that I, I talk about, you know. There's no way I could have seen all that stuff clearly while I was still confounded in religion. You have to stand uh, as, apart from that system and be on clear ground. Now, we still need fellowship, though. And YouTube is as toxic, if not more toxic, than the institutional church. But we've met people. You know, the walls is not the end-all, be-all of fellowship. The comments on walls is not the fellowship. I mean, it's nice. And I treasure on my wall, I do see really good, healthy comments and engagement. But eventually, you end up pairing up with people and knowing people... Uh, and emailing people and then, you know, chatting with people and you got little groups, you know. I can't do that with everybody, but I've got my circles and they, those people have their circles and it goes on and, and hopefully people are engaging in that way. We do need that fellowship. And somebody said, well, you know, though that's just virtual. You need to be in contact with people physically because if you were to die, none of those people are be sick. None of those people would be in your hospital, you know. And I'm like, well, None of the institutional churches I ever went to, any of those people would be at the hospital if I got sick. You know, none of them. I mean, anytime I disappeared from a church or got kicked out or had to leave, nobody came looking for me. But I guarantee that if something happened to me and I was off 
YouTube for a while or off uh, the chat, these people would come find me. They would find a way, even though it's virtual. What I have through this is more real than anything I've ever had uh, in terms of fellowship in the institutional churches. I've never had any real fellowship in an institutional church, ever. It's all been fake. It's all been fake. Uh, and that's sad. I, I do believe that there are places where you can have fellowship, but I have not found it. And I've met a lot of people who have had the same struggle. You know, uh, we, we're living in the time of apostasy. And if you're sitting, listening to message after message that's a mix of truth and error, then chances are you're sitting amongst a group of people that's a mix of weeds, tares, and wheat, and wheat, you know, sheep and wolves. And there's no fellowship in that. I did a message in John about uh, don't talk to me about love until Judas, until while well, Judas is in the room, you know, when we were John 13. Jesus didn't really start speaking the truth, opening up the mysteries, in John 14 through 17, until Judas had left. There's things that he can't disclose in the presence of a mixture. Uh, he has to take his disciples aside, and there is a need for separation under the truth. And that's where the fellowship is. Just because you're all meeting together in the same room doesn't mean you actually have the fellowship. And just because everybody's practicing tolerance and being so nice to each other doesn't mean any of you have the fellowship. The fellowship is uh, speaking the truth in love based in the New Testament ministry. And it's deep in the word. It really is. But what do I want to say about the institutional church? I hate the thing. I don't want to go back. I can't go back. And no, I don't think that makes me a better person. I know people who are in it that are supposed to be there and they actually can function in, in their capacity and they actually help people and love them and they're better people than I am. I'll give them that. I've got a friend who I think he's a better man than I am. He's uh, He really loves people in that environment and he can tolerate things that I cannot tolerate. I can't, I can't do it. And it's my weakness and my failure. And yet, through my weakness and failure, I've run to Jesus and he's given me something better than a better version of myself he's given me something better than helping me succeed in that area where I failed instead he took me into his arms and just started pouring out truth you know and he's using me in a different way and that's what he's doing with this YouTube community and the grace community he's uh allowing us to speak about things that you're not hearing in an institutional church. And if we were in the institutional churches, we would not be able to be used in this way. There's no way we could speak this clearly. So you can't, you can't have them both, you know. Uh, so if you're struggling, though, with this, you know, I'm, I'm not getting fed, don't feel bad about it. I've got a message called, The Beaten Sheep Need the Good Samaritan, You Jerk. Uh, I'll try to find a link for it and stick it in the description. And another one called uh, Shepherd, Where Do You Make Your Flock Lie Down, I think. That one's a good one. I'm really tired. I don't feel like I did justice. I promised this person I would do a message, and I don't know what to say about it. We can't say that we're superior because we're not in the institutional church. All I could say is I was starving in the institutional church. I never found fellowship. I never found anything pure there. And I was not clear about the truth. And I couldn't see the truth clearly. And I couldn't find the comforts of God there. And when I came out, I had to go outside the camp bearing his reproach. And I don't expect that anybody who's in the institutional church can really understand why I'm not in it. And I'm no longer trying to convince anybody why I need to why they need to come out. If they don't feel it, then they're fine. Leave them alone. And don't expect them to understand why you feel differently. You just gotta, if this is part of the deal, we just have to bear the reproach. Uh, 
and not take it like we're better than anybody because it's really our weakness and failure that led us to the Lord, you know, and it's, and everybody can see that, you know, the minute you start talking about why you're not going to church, you can't help but reveal your weakness and failure, you know, and you know it, that's why it's so troublesome. And then every time you get into one of these conversations, then the devil starts beating you and saying, you really need to go back to church because look, they're right. And yet, you know, no, I, this is, I've got to get, I've got to have Jesus and you know, I can't get him in there. But remember, we don't come to Jesus because we're good. We come to Jesus because we need him. He came for the sinners, not the righteous, for the sick, not the whole. And the trap is to think that because we're coming to Jesus, we have to be right. And because we're the ones coming to Jesus, we have to be uh, well. And so when we find out that we're coming to Jesus and yet we are revealed as being weak failures, then we go, well, then we must be wrong. And again, in Galatians, Paul said, if while I'm seeking to be justified in Christ, I'm found to be a sinner, does that make Christ a minister of sin? And what he's saying is just because the process reveals that I'm a sinner doesn't mean that the process is wrong. Coming to Christ is the answer. You know, if you want to have the fruit of the Spirit and the goodness of God in your life and you really want Christ, then you need to meet Him where you can find Him. And for many of us, that is not in the institutional church. Period. And ultimately, nobody has the right to judge you for that. Just like you don't have the right to judge them for being in the institutional church. Everybody needs to be under the Lord. But we can't say that no one needs fellowship and that there is no such thing as the church or elders or deacons or order. But we have to admit that the church today doesn't look anything like the New Testament. You know, Where's the meeting according to 1 Corinthians 15, 14 where when you come together, each one has? One has a psalm, one has a prophecy, one has uh, exhortation. Let each one prophesy one by one. Everyone speaking for the edification of the body of Christ. Where's that? Where's this practice of one man speaking while everybody is passive and listening? That didn't arrive until about the 3rd century A.D. So the practice of the present Christianity is a deviation from the New Testament scriptures. So if you try to use the New Testament to say that you have to go down to the what we call the church, the institution, and try to... Well, the problem with that is that the New Testament church and the institution are not the same thing. What we do have, though, is the ministry of the Word and the fellowship. And you go where you can find fellowship in the truth. You know, where can you find the truth? the rightly divided word, nourishment, Christ revealed, and then fellowship that results. And if you can find that, whether it's so-called virtual in the 20th century, 21st century, where you're talking to people all over the world, maybe not physically present, but with each other in spirit. You know, Paul said, Paul said, uh, he was in prison and he said, yet, even though I'm not with you in the uh, flesh, yet I'm with you in the spirit, beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. How could he do that? There's a, there's a reality of the fellowship in the spirit that transcends space and time. Yeah, it's nice if we can physically be together, but that's not always possible. And we live in the 21st century, and we need to allow for the time we live in. You know, the technology has evolved. The way people interact has evolved. And we don't all have to be in the same room to be the reality of the church. You know? Uh, the question is, when you hear the word properly opened up, do you submit to it? You know, a lot of people think they're submitting to a pastor because they obey the guy at their institutional church, but disobey the word and fight against the gospel when it's pr when it's preached properly and argue against the truth. Well, what are they doing? They are disobeying God's authorities and they're actually disobeying elders, you know, 
it, even though they think they're obedient churchgoers, when they get on YouTube, they fight and argue against actual people who are functioning as elders in the church. Uh, not by title, but by function. So can you recognize the reality, or do you have to have a system, uh, a facade, you know? We'll, we want the reality. So, anyway, what else can I say? I'm going to go home and go to sleep. Maybe I'll post this, and, and maybe this will just start a conversation, you know? Uh, I, I hope you guys are all doing well, and uh, have a good evening. Take care.